One of the more interesting categories, subcategories of the collecting of the Neapolitan dolls is the collection of dolls attributed to particular artists of the time in Naples. This is a very touchy subject, um, and I, I always approach it tentatively. I, it's understandable that we always ask the question, well, who made them, who made them, who designed them? And we do want to know that, and boy, I encourage it so much because I think it's, it's a wonderful adventure to go on the search to try to find out who was the sculptor of them. Now, we have in the determining who might have been the sculptor of some of the Neapolitan figures, there are a couple things, three things maybe we go on. One is that very, very, very occasionally, one would say closer to never than to always by far, um, the pieces might be signed. However, if a signature appeared, it would usually be on the inside of the shoulder plate. Well, this is tricky because these costumes have usually not been taken off the doll. And should you try to do that and then untie the head from the body, um, you know, you, you can see the damage that you might be doing. So sometimes it's better to investigate in other ways. If, you're, if you had the energy and the time and the Italian language at your, at your grasp, you might continue with other people and pursue the study in the, um, in the archives, in the Naples archives and other archives in Italy, where you will find references to some of the artists and to the pieces uh, that they made. That, again, is, becomes attributed to, because unless you have a very, very definite provenance or history of a piece, it's very difficult to say with certainty that a piece was made by a particular artist. Um, I wanted their, their backgrounds of some of the artists. Here are some of their names. There was San Martino. These are the ones that we have had attributed. Um, this is San Martino, who did this wonderful man with a pipe. We're going to come back and show you these in a minute. Polidaro, um, who did the water boy. Uh, Celebrano, a very famous Italian sculptor, who did the bagpipe man. Um, Lorenzo Mosca, that I um, talked to you about a minute ago, about the aged lady. Here was another aged lady he, he did, holding the, um, with her arms like this. And then um, we have Salvatore De Franco, and then sitting in the chair with his, um, with his mandolin um, is another wonderful example. So we have all of these great pieces right here that have all had been attributed to certain artists. And I think, here's what I think. I think they're absolute great works of art. I think that it's a wonderful study. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, to explore more, to try to find features that they have in common. It's been, it becomes complicated because one artist might have been taught by another artist or one artist might have his own school. And so he would be teaching artists to do works in the same style he did. So then if you were talented and came from that school, you would be doing it. So I think what it does, I think the benefit of attributing it to a certain artist is that you have, it makes you hone your, your judgment skills a little more. You look at pieces a little more carefully. You look at the style of how, for example, this fellow has very textured and comb-marked hair, and this fellow has very smooth hair. Now, is that stylistic of this, each of these particular dolls, or is that stylistic of the artist? And then you start asking all of these questions, and it becomes, it just opens up so many things for you to explore and to learn and to know. We don't always have to put a definite label on something in order to recognize it for its artistry. Trying to search who the artist of these dolls would be helps you develop your artistic eye in knowing it. You might ask why um, some of these artists didn't sign their pieces. Remember, they were fine artists. They were doing commission pieces for the king in marble and stone. They were doing it for the great churches of the of the um, of the city. They were doing the palace the palace rooms. They were commissioned to decorate. They would not want to put their name freely on these pieces that were considered more playful. And that was that's an important thing to keep in mind. A little while ago, I compared it, for example, to Carrier Belurs, the the creators of the famous. Um, Art character dolls by Cameron Reinhardt, the famous sculptors, um, did not, uh, Lewin Funks, did not want to put his name on 
uh, the particular work of sculpture that he was doing because he was a, quote, fine artist, and this was play. Um, this was, there's a wonderful quote, again, from that exhibition book at the 2008 Kimball Museum. If you can get your hands on that catalog, you really, it's just really a wonderful thing. And the quote had said, um, what it was great, the sculpting of the common folk, which these were, and this is not, the fine artists did not sculpt common folk, they sculpted royalty and gods and angels and pieces like that, but not the people of the street. The sculpting of common folk with all their unenchanting features, such as warts and goiters, their wrinkles and their grimaces, was exclusive to the Precipio, the theater dolls. And as the author um, Catello notes in his introduction, quote, allowed the peasant classes to be depicted in a sympathetic light, still with all their foibles and in all their misery, but also with a sense of humor. And I thought that was a wonderful way of describing what they did. I'll tell you what it also did is in a very practical sense. Um, even though the art of patronage was prevalent in Naples at that time, you, you as a wealthy aristocrat um, would be the patron of a, quote, starving artist. Um, it might never be enough for the artist to support his family. And the sculpting of these figures, guess what? It gave that artist bread and butter. He could pay the rent that month. He could put food on his table. So that's why so many of them did this. And it was, it was just a joyful one for them. Um, Mosca, the one I mentioned, Lorenzo Mosca, who was the bureaucrat that the others considered a dilettante, I really loved him because after all, this man had a good income. He, was a, he had his ready steady source of income, but he loved sculpting, he loved drawing. And the king loved his work. So he commissioned him to make a lot of the pieces. And again, remember I talked to you before that the king had a special interest in the um, costumes of, the regional costumes of the area. And very often you'll find pieces that have been attributed to Lorenzo Mosca that are wearing um, the regional costumes such as this wonderful woman is. And she has so many features going for her. She's an attributed artist. She has a sculpted cap. And I want you to notice the details of the cap. Let me move this gentleman down so you can see it better. She has the beading around the cap and the, the little sculpting detail at the top of her pate. She has a wonderful, wonderful face. Beautifully done wrinkles. And when she comes around, you can say, notice that the wrinkles and the, her, her aging process is repeated down through her throat and onto her back. Very, very, I mean, definitely fine, fine sculpture in my opinion. And then look at her hands. When they chose what carved wooden hands would go on this woman, these are not a young woman's hands. Very beautiful work in her original piece. It's an outstanding model in my example. This fellow, you talk about all of their they could do them with their, all their foils and their grimaces. So he has, he has a big hooked nose and he's got a wart on his cheek and he's balding at the back of his head. But that was fun for them to do. And when you think about the theater and the opera that was thriving in Venice at the time, these were, these were characters in the comic, comic opera. These were the village people in the comic opera. They're just absolutely wonderful. I love the gentleman sitting in his chair. I'm not going to move him, but you can see how absolutely grand he is. And before I was talking about some of them had details of, of the leggings and the shoes that was a little more than just the plain stocking. And here you can see he has the, um, the, like the ruffled upper part of his legging and then tied with a string to hold on. So very, very wonderfully done. I found him to be a fascinating. I wondered what he was doing with his pails. And I found in one of the books a reference to this character being uh, the water bearer. And so I, that I wasted another half hour of my life, well, maybe half a day, um, looking up the water bearers in Naples. And this, was, this is where dolls can take us on these historical journeys. Water was a very precious in Naples. It was considered very, very pure and very wonderful and healthy drinking water. 
And so it's one of the reasons why many other Europeans came to Naples. Well, many of them had access to water, but they actually had running water in their homes and they had access to it. But for other people, they needed to have drinking water on the streets. And so there were people called the water boys and they sold water. And it was considered a very fine refreshment. So you'd go and rather than sit down and have a beer, you'd go and have a big pail of water. It's a wonderful face. Now this fellow I don't think is having water. I think he is having his bottle of wine right there. But this is by San Martino. It's considered one of the finest pieces. And everything about this is an absolute work of art. His accessories, his pose, even the positioning of his hand, holding, cradling the pipe bowl. The way his beard is not just painted, it's very, it's a stubby little beard, um, very fashionable today, but it's textured and then shaded, it's wonderfully done. And then finally, one of my favorites is the Bagpipe Man. All right, and the Bagpipe Man was done by, is attributed to Celebrano, who was one of the famous artists of the time. And this is the very, particular Italian bagpipe, a very specialized one, and very, very um, unique to this doll. And look at, look at his face. His costume is extraordinary. It's tin, and it's like embossed tin, and not definitely not a suit of armor, but very protective. But then look at his sculpted shoes with the leggings, the wrinkled leggings, wonderful piece. So the searching after attributed pieces, I think, is a fascinating um, exploration in the search for Neapolitan dolls. I also think that many of these larger, these being large, uh, pieces that were attributed to artists, you'll find very similar examples in the smaller sizes. And so the question, these are all questions I've had as I've gone along. And honestly, I haven't found anyone that can give me a really good answer. Were they works? that were done in that artist's studio? Were they smaller, like reductions of the original work he did? Or were they pieces that people had copied? We run into the same problem when we try to research the, the German bisque dolls with sculpted hair, for example. Uh, one company would make it, another one would see the mold and say, oh, that's nice, and they would take the mold and they would sort of cast it themselves and do their own version. So you might find three or four companies doing virtually the same doll. That was going on 100 years later. Now we need to get into these, study them more, and find out more about them. And I'm going to finish up by showing you the wonderful um, cover doll from our catalog. So I talked to you before um, when we were panning the whole scenes of the, of the various um, dolls. And I talked to you about the fascination with ethnography that was growing up in the mid-1700s. And the King Fernand had a, Fernand had, had a special interest in this and really promoted it, and consequently, um, many of the people creating Neapolitan figures delved deeply in this field because they knew it would appeal to the king. He would want the figures for his theater. Then it would appeal to the aristocracy because the king loved it. And so this became a whole genre that was really, really important to them. And here are some of the wonderful pieces that fall within what I call the royalty or um, traveling from the East themes, and you'll see them. And so we have here two examples of the very, basically the same type of man, um, the black haired man with a wonderful mustache. And again, you can do research and find out the different names of these mustaches. And one of them in a smaller size and one the larger. I love the smaller size man because he's carrying this wonderful um, silver treasure chest. And again, as I pointed out to you, I think these figures, when they're posed with an object, are just stunning. I think it really brings them even more to life than they are. But his larger, handsome fellow is quite fine. And let's look at his boots again, because I want you to see the extra details of his boots. Um, they have the uh, rims around them. They have the painted stockings above, the little gold buttons. Um, 
pointy toe, very, very fine. And then check him out. He is one handsome guy, let me tell you. And he knows it. Dress to kill. I've been watching the Spanish princess in the evening and I keep and I say, Oh my gosh, there are the costumes, there are the costumes and I keep seeing that and so I they're having particularly meaning to me right now. And so you might any of you enjoy watching that series just to see these various costumes. And then we have this handsome gentleman right here. With the spear. Very beautifully done. Very fine sculpting of his hair. The costume is just extraordinary. Very, very lavish use of some of the pieces that were actually commissioned by the king, they used real jewels in. In fact, there is a story I came across at one point that some of the pieces had so much so many jewels on them that in later years they needed money and they took the piece, the jewels off and sold them. Um, I don't know the veracity of that story or not, but it was fascinating. I don't suspect these are real stones. I believe these are um, glass beads, but nevertheless, they're just with the gilt trim and the um, paillettes and the uh, glass stones, they're wonderful. And again, look at his face. Look at the uh, uh, hands even. Look at the detail of sculpting on the hands. This is a very handsome and wonderful doll. And then one more to show you from this category is this wonderful page. It's called the Asian page. And again, see the hair? I talked to you about that story before. A bald pate with a tuft of hair at the back of the head. Wonderful. We'll put his little cap back on. And then we have our cover doll from the Dallas Theater. We have Balthazar from the Three Wise Men, or the Magi. And I want just you to be able to see him from many different angles here. So you can see, you see his coat. I want you to look at the horse too, because the horse is sculpted. Look at the tail of the horse that is sculpted. Look at the mane of the horse, the decoration on it. And then he is riding. He is posable. He's removable from the saddle. You just take him off and you can take his legs because they're, again, they're with that wonderful wire um, armature, posable wire armature. And if you wanted him to be standing, you could have him standing like he's arrived. And his wonderful costume he's wearing with his saber with all of the um, faux jewels, pearls, and the horse with his wonderful enamel eyes. And again, look at even his boots. All right, the open toe boots with the green, with the gilt edging on them, very, very distinctive. I'll take his hat off so you can see how his head is sculpted all around. Wonderful piece. And behind me, we have his two partners. We have Melchior. Um, and you can see very handsome younger man, a different style of beard. Again, the study of the beards and the mustaches, you could do a complete study on them. And he's riding in on his black horse, again, with wonderful carving of the mane. All the decorations on the horse are extraordinary. Silver stirrups, silver stirrups. And he has uh, the brown painted shoes. Very, very handsome, wonderful early costume. And again, you could, if you wanted to dismount him from the horse and have pose him standing, you could do that. 
And then on this side, we have <coughs> Casper. Casper is riding a beautiful white horse. With Look at the way they did the decoration all around it and the silver work on it and his harness and his wonderful uh, silver stirrup. I think if I hold it up, you might be able to see it a little better. Wonderful work on that. These are very, very rare pieces and beautifully done. Handsome face on him. The costume is, I don't know which one I like the most. I, I think there's no choice. You need all three. They're just grand. The Magi. So that would be the beginning of that is part one. This is a very, very small number of dolls from our auction coming up. Um, the doll is theater and Neapolitan dolls of the 18th century. And I hope I've given you a taste of some of the things that you might look forward to seeing there. In the auction, we also have many beautiful backgrounds, accessories, uh, furnishings, uh, pieces of little jewelry, um, baskets of food, wonderful animals. Oh, I love the animals, wonderful animals. There's so much excitement there. It's a full day auction and it's going to be on live audio video feed all day long. So you can sit at home, put your feet up, have a great time, and hopefully bring one home. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.